I have a confession to make. Um, I'm actually here by mistake. <laughs> I'm a neurobiologist, and back in, I think it was 2001, I was studying to become yet another ordinary, off-the-rack neurobiologist. And then something happened. I got a scholarship to study abroad in New Zealand at the University of Auckland for one year. But when I came there, due to some random computer mistake, I was not enrolled as a neurobiologist student. Instead, I was enrolled as a psychology student, a last year psychology student. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure what I was thinking, but I was thinking it might be interesting to see what the brain looks like to a psychologist. So I ended up taking all the psychologist courses I could find about how the brain functions, uh, but from a psychologist's point of view. And I didn't know it at the time, but neuroscience and psychology, even though this is rather large research field, they were not communicating, especially not at that time. So things we, big research questions in psychology have been answered a long time ago within neuroscience and vice versa. And I didn't know it at the time that this taking distant knowledge that hasn't been combined before, and when you combine that into new uh, recombination, that is actually the essence of creativity. Uh, and I'm so lucky that's what I'm doing today. I get, have a job where I get to take pictures of the brain, if my nose haven't uh, revealed it, this is a picture of uh, my brain. Uh, and I have a job where I get to look inside humans' brains and try to understand the processes that make us uh, be creative and ask questions like, why are some people more creative than others? And perhaps the more interesting one, how can we use this knowledge to make people more creative? Um, and in this talk, I will try to give you an update of how far I've gotten in this uh, research, and let's see how that goes. So if you want to understand how creativity looks like in the brain, it's actually quite simple. Um, you can say creativity is a rather complex uh, term to study and it involves many different things, but the underlying neural process is actually quite simple. And all it's about is taking something we already know and combining it in a new way. You have to realize here that the brain is not capable of producing new material from scratch. We can only take what we have in our memory system and then combine that in different fashions. You could think about your memory system like a bag of Lego bricks. So you can take these Lego bricks, you can combine them in an infinite number of ways, but if all your Lego bricks are red, you can only create red structures. And that means that creativity is highly dependent on the type of information we have in our memory system. But that's actually not the real key to creativity. Because it doesn't matter if you have the coolest Lego bricks in your back if your brain doesn't make them available to you. And we all know the situation that we hear some really cool new idea and we are thinking, wow, I, why didn't I get this, this idea? I had all the information that I could so that I could have gotten the idea, but I didn't. So it's all about understanding how the brain gives us access to our memory system. So let's take a word like mosquito here. Whenever we see this word, or hear a mosquito, or think about a mosquito, the entire concept of mosquito is activated within our memory system. And then we believe there's a spread of activation throughout our associative network, where all information we have that's associated to mosquito is also activated. And it makes a lot of sense, then we can access information that we need faster. And you need to understand that the way that this happens the closest associations we have are activated to a higher degree than the more remote associations. And of course it makes sense, but it has the consequence that when we work creatively trying to solve some kind of problem, the brain will give us information that it used last time we were in a similar situation. And that's quite clever from an evolutionary point of view because it saves energy. But the brain thinks that we want to solve the problem the same way as last time. And if the task is to come up with new solutions, we want the exact opposite. And this effect is quite easy to demonstrate. This is a study we did quite recently where we took 150 subjects, put them through five brainstorming sessions, and they generated a little more than 7,000 ideas. And then we evaluated each idea blindly for the greater value. And what we found is, and what's been found many times before, is that when people brainstorm, the first ideas we get are all the same. Because when we start brainstorming, the brain gives us the close association and those we share. It's not until we get into the more distantly related uh, information that we can create completely new ideas. And it also evidently means that creativity takes time. 
And this brings me to a very important point, and that is that there's two pathways to creativity. One thing is to understand these creative uh, skills, and you can think creatively. Some people have that to a higher degree than others. But there's also a pathway that's called hard work, persistence. And you can achieve almost the same just by working hard. But what does all of this look like in the brain? And is it really true? This is one of the things that I've been working on. Is it really true that how our memory system activates uh, information? Can that really determine how creative people are? So we did a rather large study that we published not so long ago, where we took a group of people, put them inside a brain scanner, and we gave them a quite demanding task that required their full attention. And while they were performing this task, we were showing different kind of objects in the background. This task was so difficult that the this, this subjects, they, they had no idea why they were viewing these objects. They were completely irrelevant for the task that they were doing. And most of the subjects couldn't even remember having seen them afterwards. And then we took the subjects out of the brain scanner. We gave them a lot of uh, a battery of creativity tests where they had to work creatively with these objects. And then we asked what, for me, is the ultimate research question. Is it possible for these automatic, reflexive way that the brain just perceives an object, can we from this activity predict creativity? And it turned out that we can to a much higher degree than I would ever have anticipated. In these two areas of the brain, which is part of the associative memory system, we could predict both quite accurately how many ideas a person can get with a certain object and also how creative that person is. And now I know many of you are thinking, this is Hopefully, uh, you're thinking that this is quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> I think it's fascinating. Uh, and you think this, this is some nice pictures of the brain, but so what? I can tell you these different colors that, that we see in the brain, we call these blobs. So you'll be thinking some nice blobs he has there. But so what? What can we use this information for? And the good news is that it's actually kind of uh, quite easy to mimic what the creative brain is doing. We can do that in many different ways. We can do it with exercises. Uh, but what I've found is the far most effective way is by telling people how the brain functions. So we did a rather large study with 200 students trying to give them thorough information about how the memory system works, how they retrieve information, how we filter this information, how it works in terms of creativity. And we could see within just six weeks that people's creative ability rose with almost 30%. And it seems that once you become aware of all this, how it functions in your brain, you can easily adapt it to the way that you work. And this was in students. Later on, we tried in professional companies where people have worked in the same areas for perhaps a decade, working on the same type of problem. And once you tell them how the brain is sometimes working against them when we want to work creative, the, the increase is massive, up to 70%. So now I've told you about how we retrieve information. But I've also said that creativity is also about reconnecting this information. And that brings me to the next point. And this is actually one of the first things I studied in my career. Um, if you can't see it, that's me up there. Uh, not so long ago, just a few years. <laughs> um, this is actually one of the favorite periods in my life, because uh, at the time I was writing music and playing uh, heavy metal concerts in the evenings to make a living, and during the daytime I was studying how my brain was enabling me to do so. And you can ask the question, why music impro improvisation? Why is this important? And to me, I think that music improvisation is one of the best windows we have into understanding the creating process in creativity. When you improvise, it's difficult to really prepare, and there's no time to evaluate your ideas. The only choice you have is to just play whatever comes to mind. And this is what it looks like if you take professional musicians and put them inside a brain scanner and ask them to improvise. We see activity uh, that's particularly related to improvisation in this frontal part of the brain called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And compared to control, you can see here that there's more activity in this area. But that's actually not completely so. This area is not more activated compared to control, it is less deactivated. I know that's a little bit complicated to understand, but I'll try to show it here. So the neural patterns we found in professional musicians when they were improvising were all part of what we call the brain's default network. And this is a network of areas in the brain that's active when we're not doing anything. So when you go home tonight, lie on the couch and do absolutely nothing, this is the areas in the brain that will be activated. And we all know this mental state that we're in. That's when your mind starts to wander. You go in all different kinds of directions and seemingly uncontrollable. 
And we know in normal individuals, when we focus on a task, we turn off or turn down all these spontaneous thoughts so that we can focus on the task at hand. And what we found with these musicians is that somehow they forget to turn off the spontaneous thoughts, even though they're focusing on performing a specific task. And the important thing is that it's not just something we saw in professional musicians. We've also seen this, in, I've seen it in all my studies of creativity, you see it repeatedly, creative people somehow forget to turn off the spontaneous system while they're working on a task. And this is a much more difficult challenge, so how can we mimic this in normal people? And you can think, wouldn't it be nice if we could have some kind of volume control button where we could turn up the spontaneous thoughts, or we could turn them down, or even go into focus mode? And uh, this is actually possible. Together with my colleague, Balda Onerheim, who's sitting right down here, uh, we've spent the last few years trying to figure out, can we take the neural patterns we have served in highly creative individuals and move those over to normal individuals? And here we're using a technology called TES, which is transcranial electrical stimulation. And it's a si quite simple technology. As you can see in this picture, the whole thing is driven by a 9-volt battery. So it's a very mild uh, current that, uh, that we put to the brain, and it's so mild that it doesn't actually change uh, how the neurons fire in the brain as such. But we change the threshold for when a neuron can fire. And that means that we can preserve the natural patterns that the neurons are firing. You, we can preserve people's natural uh, activity, but we can turn it up or down in the areas that we stimulate. So it does actually function more or less like a volume button. Uh, here's a picture of a later prototype where we are combining it with EEG to verify that we can actually change uh, activity in the brain. This is what it looks like today. It's called Play-Doh Work, and the company making it is called Play-Doh Science. And you just open it and it turns on, and you adjust the head size, so I have a rather nice, large head. You put it on, make sure you have a good connection. And then you take out your smartphone, turn on an, uh, the app that goes along with it. Yeah. And then you're ready to stimulate. And the device will automatically detect whether or not it has a good connection to the skin. And you can choose the mental mode that you want to be in. Now, this shouldn't be misunderstood. This is not a magical uh, headset that you put it on that will, it will not make you the new Einstein. It can, <laughs> although, not yet. <laughs> Uh, but right now, what we can do is we can take people's natural activity and we can turn it up or down in these areas. This is a quite old technology within neuroscience, so it's fairly well tested, and we know that, that uh, it changed brain function. It's a well-tested technology, and we can show within laboratories that we can stimulate people and we can make them better in different kind of tasks. We can even use it to treat depression, and this technology is, is rather used in, in these situations. But the real question, the one that we are asking is, so what about in real life? Can people use this in their daily work? So right now we have around 200 people around the world that's testing this for us. So, but we're doing this a little bit differently than normally done. So instead of us telling them how they should use it, we've just given it to them and asking them to tell us how it works, in which situation it works. Because we think that there's quite a big chance that there, there will be a lot of individual, of course there will be many individual differences depending on what kind of job people do. And for some people it will work and for some people it won't work. But we've developed an online platform where people can test this and tell us how it works. So this is extremely exciting times ahead of us. I hope that I have inspired you with this talk. And uh, next time you experience something random like I did, I hope that you will embrace it and perhaps it will change your life like it did mine. Thank you.